Questions oral, oral questions, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, Canadians watched for the last two years and thought to themselves, there's no way the Prime Minister could possibly fail any more this summer than he has been for the past. And what did the Prime Minister say? Hold my beer. <laughs> His carbon tax coalition is in shambles. The U.S. went ahead and negotiated a new deal with Mexico while Canada was on the sidelines, and there's still no plan to deal with illegal border crossers. But the Prime Minister's biggest failure was the Trans Mountain Pipeline. The courts ruled that he failed to execute the process, and he has no plan to restart it. Does the Prime Minister understand that his failures are hurting Canadians all over the country? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, allow me to take a moment first as we return to this place to welcome an entirely new cohort of pages to the House. Thank you, young people. Mr. Speaker, uh, over the past three years, we've seen uh, the lowest unemployment in 40 years. Mm -hmm. We've seen the creation of uh, over half a million new full-time jobs, yeah. the fastest growth in the G7 uh, last year. Uh, and on top of that, Mr. Speaker, by the end of next year, every can, every, the average middle-class family will be receiving $2,000 more in their bank accounts uh, because of this government than they did under uh, the previous Conservative government. We're continuing with our plan for the middle class. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, this Prime Minister has chased away billions of dollars of investment in our energy sector, and he used a variety of ways to do it. He cancelled Energy East, which would have seen Western Canadian oil brought to Eastern markets, displacing foreign oil. He's brought in a ban on pipelines in Bill C-69, and his carbon tax is chasing away investment from all around the world. And when it comes to Trans Mountain, the court was very clear. The judge ruled that, quote, his, that, that his government's efforts fell well short of the mark and that he did not adequately discharge his duties. How could the Prime Minister fail so badly on this? Right out of the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, for 10 years, the Conservative government under Stephen Harper had a single focus to support the oil sands uh, by getting our resources to new markets other than the United States. They failed. They couldn't get any of our resources to new markets because they refuse to accept that the only way to move forward on energy projects is to uh, respect Indigenous peoples and to defend the environment at the same time. That is exactly what we've been working on for three years. That's what we're going to continue to work on. The Trans Mountain Project is in the national interest and we're going to get it built in the right way. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, let's look at the facts. Before this Prime Minister took office, you didn't need an act of Parliament to get a pipeline built. No, right. Americans were trying to put their money into Canada. Now this Prime Minister is writing a cheque to buy them out of the energy sector. And the facts are also clear. Under the previous Conservative government, Four major pipelines were built. The Enbridge Alberta Clipper, the Trans Canada Keystone, Kinder Morgan Anchor Loop, Enbridge Line 9B Reversal, all approved and built Bill. under a Conservative government. It's his policies that have failed, and the judge was very clear, he failed to get this job done. The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. Uh, the uh, Alberta oil industry, indeed Canadians, know well that our priority is getting our resources to new markets other than the United States. We get a discount of about $15 billion every year because we are trapped to the American market. We need to get our resources to new markets safely, securely, and that's where the previous government failed. We are moving forward in respect and in partnership with Indigenous peoples, moving forward uh, in being serious about environmental science and sustainability because we know getting these pipelines built the right way is what matters to all Canadians. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister's summer of failure wasn't just about pipelines. It also included his lack of a plan to deal with the illegal border crosser crisis. For months, the Prime Minister has been attacking as un-Canadian anyone who criticizes his lack of action. He also claimed that the flood of illegal crossers would have no impact on the processing times of lawful applicants. We now know that wasn't Can't true. Anything, In right? fact, the Immigration and Refugee Board says, and I quote, projected wait times are, not, are now expected to decrease, increase from the current 20 months. Does the Prime Minister think that his own officials are un-Canadian? Right. Right, Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, over the past year and a half, we have seen uh, uh, people crossing from the American side uh, in greater numbers, which represents a challenge. That's why we have invested in uh, the necessary measures to process and evaluate anyone uh, crossing the border irregularly to ensure that we continue uh, to apply uh, our entirety of our immigration rules, our refugee rules, and our security rules to them. Uh, this is something we will continue to do. We have lots more work to do, but we are on the right track on this, and Canadians can be reassured that our immigration system remains secure and strong. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister also failed to stop the number of illegal crossers at the borders, and this has serious consequences. The numbers have increased, and more than 95 percent of them came through Quebec. Now the figures are showing that people following the regular process will have to wait even longer because of the increase in the number of illegal border crossers. Quebecers and Canadians want to know why the Prime Minister has failed to protect our border. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Conservatives want to instill concern and worry among Canadians. We want to reassure Canadians that our immigration system is being fully implemented. We are fully b verifying the backgrounds of people coming in. We are applying our immigration system to the letter. We can rest assured that we have a good system that is serving Canadians, and we are continuing to invest more resources into this system. The Honourable Member for Mouski Nejet Basque. Mr. Speaker, the dairy producers I met with this summer are facing serious sacrifices, uh, like uh, under CETA, and now they're having trouble making ends meet. What they're concerned about is that the Liberals are saying they're going to be su protecting supply management, but they're also talking about concessions at the same time. They've heard they heard the same promises under the previous uh, uh, Conservatives. I'd like a clear answer, Mr. Speaker. Do the Liberals intend to fully protect supply management uh, under the NAFTA negotiations? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as people know, we are continuing our work as part of to renegotiate NAFTA. We have been very clear we are going to protect supply management and we are going to ensure that our economy, citizens, and benefit from a good agreement. Not just any agreement, a good agreement. The new NAFTA agreement will, we will make sure, be a good agreement for Canadians. That is what the Canadians expect from us. NDP leader Jamit Singh was in Burnaby South this weekend talking with people who can't find affordable, quality housing. One of these people, a senior named Edward, hasn't been able to find a place and will be homeless by the end of this month. Liberals acknowledge we have a housing crisis, but instead of acting to fix this crisis, they are following the Conservative example and holding back funding for housing until after the next election. Will the Liberal government stop telling Canadians like Edward to wait and invest in housing now and not in two years? Honourable Prime Minister. On the contrary, Mr. Speaker, our investments in infrastructure and housing across this country are making a real difference for Canadians, and we are indeed moving forward on something the Conservatives never did. We see a federal role for housing. That's why we've put together a $40 billion plan to invest in housing, a national housing strategy that is going to deliver for Canadians right across the country. We understand the pressures faced by Canadians in our large cities, in small communities right across the country. And this government is stepping up to help them. 
Honorable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Speaker, no child in Canada should ever have to beg for the right to quality education in a safe and comfy school. And the children of Kishetchewan are here today to tell this Prime Minister that they're done with the begging. They are tired of the positive words and the broken promises. They are tired of the squalor and the flooding and the children being medevaced out when they're sick. So to the Prime Minister, let's just cut to the chase. What is the financial commitment he will make today to ensure that we get those children off that floodplain and into a safe and comfy school that they deserve? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, no relationship is more important than that with Indigenous peoples, and that's why from the very beginning we invested $8.6 billion over the coming years uh, in making sure that we move towards parity in education. In working with the community of Kishetuan, an interim solution has been found to allow classes to start this week while a longer-term solution is identified. We're supporting the community's request for a long-term modular school solution, and we will be working with them to expedite the project. Kishetuan students remain our priority as we determine next steps, with further updates on the solutions expected later this week. I thank the member opposite for his question. For Timmins, James Bay. An interim solution. You know, this past week, the Prime Minister berated First Nation leaders for wasting his time. He said it wasn't reconciliation. If he talks to the children of Kishetchewan, they will tell him that positive words isn't going to build them a school. That's it right. takes political will. And in their short life, they have seen endless broken promises from government. So now we have the promise of another Band-Aid. So let's cut to the chase. If he won't cost out the price of those Band-Aid solutions, give us the timeline. When is he going to get those children off that floodplain and into a safe and comfy school? Give us that answer now and stop wasting our time. Order, I remind the member for Timmins, James Bay, to direct his comments to the chair. The right honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the road to reconciliation is a long one, but there are immediate steps we can and must be taking, which we are taking. We recognize the need to invest right now in emerging mental health crises, uh, in housing needs, in education needs to help Indigenous uh, students and people right across the country, while at the same time we move forward uh, towards greater rights and recognition, towards greater partnership, towards greater uh, autonomy for Indigenous peoples in this country. That is something that we are on on together as a journey. It is one uh, in which we are uh, partners and which we work with respect and openness. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, the number of illegal border crosses things, uh, remains problematic. While the Liberals are attempting to imply that they have the situation under control, the data is showing the opposite. We've seen an increase in the number of illegal entries over the past two months, July and August including 95 per cent in Quebec alone. This is another failure by the Liberal government and by our Prime Minister. Liberals must take tangible steps to prevent illegal border crossers. This has been going on for two years. When will we see a plan? And when will we see an end to these failures by the Prime Minister? The Honourable Minister of Border Security. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our government has a clear plan to address border crossers. We have invested over $173 million to improve border security and to speed up processing claims. And contrary to the remarks of my colleague across the way, in the last few months, we have seen a decrease in the number of asylum seekers that are crossing the border regularly, including a drop, Mr. Speaker, for the month of August of 70 per cent over what we witnessed last year. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasco. Mr. Speaker, the data that I gave come from his own department, so we didn't invent anything. That's in addition to Trans Mountain, an out-of-control deficit, NAFTA, a lack of ethics and transparency. Let's be clear, these failures by the Prime Minister are having an impact on Canadians. Fewer jobs, fewer opportunities, investments fleeing the country, and out-of-control spending at the expense of our children and grandchildren. Canadians deserve better, Mr. Speaker. Is the Prime Minister aware of these failures and the impact they are having on Canadians? The Minister of Finance. It's very important to have accurate figures, Mr. Speaker. We are in a situation where unemployment is among the lowest it's been in the past 40 years. What that means is that there are more and more Canadians working, more than 500,000 people are working full-time 
now as compared to before. This is a growth rate that is higher than in the G7. And this, we will continue to improve the situation for the middle class for all Canadians. Honourable Member for Milton. Mr. Speaker, it was interesting in his questions and his answers today. The Prime Minister had a little slip of the tongue, and he referred to Canada's oil industry as Alberta's oil industry. And I can tell you something, Mr. Speaker. It is all Canadian resource yeah. families. Yeah. families want is they want real leadership. Right. Leadership, people who work hard to get the policy done so that they can go out and build the pipeline. Yeah. What is the plan that the Prime Minister has? Or is he just going to say to them it's going to be another fall season of failure? Mr. Speaker, we move forward with the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion because we know how critically important it is to Canadians. We know how important it is for our economy. We are not going to take lessons from the previous government who failed to get resources to international markets. We know that 99% of our resources go to the United States. We must create international access for our resources, and that's exactly what we're going to do promptly by listening and having meaningful consultation with Indigenous Canadians and considering environmental impacts that are so important. The Honourable Member for Milton. Mr. Speaker, I think my favourite word of the summer was de-risking. <laughs> and that's exactly what the Minister of Finance said that the purchase of the Trans Mountain Pipeline would do for this project. It would de-risk it. Didn't really work out for them very well, did it, Mr. Speaker? I'm glad the Minister of Finance recognizes the importance of the pipeline to our economy. But I have a very simple question for him. He had a summer of failure, too. What is his plan to get this pipeline built? Yeah. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, the court has been very clear. We need to move forward promptly without unnecessary delay, and that is exactly what we're going to do. We will not take lessons from the previous failed government. What we will do is move forward, having meaningful engagement with Indigenous Canadians, ensuring that we deal with environmental risks in the appropriate way, giving confidence that this project can go forward so we have access to international markets. The previous government was unable to do that. We have resolved to make sure we do it in the right way. The Honourable Order. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, the facts. In 2014, the Supreme Court ruled on consulting First Nations. In June 2016, the Federal Court of Appeal affirmed the same. On November 1, 2016, the Liberal appointed panel that consulted First Nations on Trans Mountain reported to Cabinet, and 28 days later, Cabinet approved the expansion. The Prime Minister and all those Liberals repeatedly said their process would survive a court challenge. But two years later, on August 30th, the courts ruled the Liberals failed. After the summer of total failure, what is the plan to get the Trans Mountain yeah, expansion? Yeah, yeah. Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, we understand that the uh, building of the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion project is in the national interest. We will not follow the failed policies of the Conservative government. We are going to meaningfully consult with Indigenous people, make sure we are engaging with them in two-way dialogue that finds accommodation for the concerns where it's possible to do so. We are going to look after the environment and making sure that we are meeting our environmental obligations. We are going to move forward on this project in the right way to build so those order I remind members that it's the responsibility of the speaker to try to ensure that every member can be heard here and therefore I'd ask other members not to interrupt and not to speak when someone else is speaking it's simple respect it is certainly uh, worth the dignity of this chamber and our responsibility to Canadians the honorable member for Lakeland Mr. Speaker, four new pipelines built under Conservatives, and the reality is the Liberals failed on the consultation on Trans Mountain. They failed to give certainty to Kinder Morgan that it could be built. They promised a law and failed to deliver. They failed to find a private sector investor for Trans Mountain. They failed to get shovels in the ground this summer. And now the Liberals have failed for three weeks to tell Canadians their plan to respond to the court's ruling and to get the Trans Mountain expansion built. They killed thousands of jobs. They've spent billions of tax dollars on a pipeline they can't expand. Is this all part of the Prime Minister's plan to phase out the oil sands? Yeah. 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 Honourable <laughs> Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, for almost a decade, 
the previous government failed to build a single pipeline to expand our non-US market. 99% of our oil is landlocked because they failed to explore and expand their global market. We are committed to making sure that we follow the highest standard that Canadians expect us to follow when it comes to consulting with ind indigenous peoples, when it comes to protecting the environment. We will do and build this pipeline in the right way, Mr. Speaker. Good job. Deputy de Jonquière. The Honourable Member for Jonquière. The contribution by dairy, poultry, and egg producers is essential for the Quebec economy and represents some 92,000 jobs. Unfortunately, since 2015, the government has just been perpetuating the Conservative legacy by sacrificing these producers in trade agreements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Supply management is more than an industry. It's about our regional way of life, the way we use the land, and our family farms. When will the Liberals commit to adequately protecting our producers and when will they stop signing bad agreements? Well, Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate my honourable colleague's question. I can assure her that we have and will continue to support supply management and our farmers here, here. in this system. Here, here. The Prime Minister, myself, and many other uh, ministers have indicated quite clearly that we have and will support the supply management system. It's important to note, Mr. Speaker, we are the party that fought to implement supply management, right. and I can assure my honourable colleague we're the government that's going to protect. It. Here, here. Honourable Member for Essex. Supporting means no increase in quota. Canadians spent the summer worried about their jobs under steel and aluminum tariffs, a shaky NAFTA, and repeated threats from the White House. This is especially true in my riding of Essex. This government says they're fighting to help Canadians like auto workers and supply management farm families. If that's true, how can their first piece of legislation this fall be the ratification of the job-killing CPTPP? Canadians are buying the bogus argument that this is good for Canada and working people when the deal will cost us 58,000 jobs. Will this government do the right thing and take the CPTPP off the table? Honourable Minister of International Trade Diversification. No. And we would want the Honourable Member to know that trade means growth and growth means jobs, quality jobs for Canadians. And as we expand our export markets, we expand the possibilities for these Canadians to have the chance to sell to these markets, mostly small and medium-sized enterprise. We are looking for a swift passage of this important legislation, and we hope the new Democrats will cooperate. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Old Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, many illegal Immigrants, migrants, rather, don't show up for their interviews. And CBSA officers are being muzzled by senior management, to, even though they're very concerned about cuts to security uh, stages. They're being told to skip ta stages. And now Canadians are convinced that uh, the Prime Minister doesn't care about their security. They know that we have a plan, but do they have a plan? Does the government have a plan? Mr. Border Security. Mr. Speaker, let me assure this House that our government will never compromise the safety of Canadians. Irregular border crossers are thoroughly screened, and they do not get a free ticket to remain in Canada. We on this side of the House will always stand to protect Canada's system and are taking concrete measures to do so. And it's important to recall that the Conservatives would like to talk a good game, but they cut nearly $400 million for border security measures when they were in office. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg holds Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, the minister has just uh, shown up and perhaps he doesn't have updated information. We know that the CBSA is being called to, to cut on to cut to stages in the security process, and only a handful of these illegal migrants have been deported. The new mandate letter doesn't contain any specific directives to resolve the crisis. So how can the minister resolve the problem without clear direction from the prime minister? We have a plan. Do they have a plan? Minister of Border Security. Mr. Speaker, I've received very explicit uh, instructions to lead our government's response to irregular migration. We remain unwavering in our commitment to protect the safety of Canadians. As I've already stated, we've invested $173 million to replace some of the res resources that were taken away by the previous government. Let me assure this House that everyone ordered removed has been given due process, and as all orders can be challenged through various levels of appeal, but once those legal avenues have been exhausted, individuals are expected to respect our laws and leave Canada.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable member for Calgary Nose Hill. Mr. Speaker, the minister has gotten up and talked about the hundreds of millions of dollars that this government has spent on illegal border crossers. Yet, from January and August in 2017, the numbers were 13,221. January to August this year, it was 14,125. The problem is getting worse. There's only one way this is going to get solved. That's by closing the loophole in the Safe Third Country Agreement. Right. Has the minister done anything of import, like asking the Americans to close the loophole in this agreement? Mr. Speaker, as, as the Minister for Border Security, I have been tasked with leading the engagement with the United States on the Safe Third, Third Country Agreement. To that end, I have communicated with Secretary Nielsen and, and, and asked that government to engage with us on this important issue. There have been some discussions to date, and that will continue. Honourable Member. The Honourable Member for Calgary knows Hill. I'll summarize that as uh, uh, no. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the member for Scarwood Gilwood said the following. People who have come to the conclusion that these people, illegal border crossers, are not refugees and they should be returned sooner rather than later. A Conservative government would close the loophole in the Safe Third Country Agreement and remove those expeditiously who do not have a legal reason to be in Canada. Mr. Speaker, that's very simple. It's what Canadians want. That is a Canadian thing to ask for. When will this government close the loophole in the Safe Third Country Agreement? Mr. Speaker, Canada has a long tradition and proud tradition of providing protection to those who need it most by providing refuge to the world's most vulnerable people. And at the same time, we are, must ensure the security of our communities and the integrity of our border. The Immigration and Refugee Protection Act requires the ongoing review of all designated third countries to ensure that the conditions that led to their designation continue. And as I have already indicated, I have reached out to Secretary Nielsen to discuss issues related to irregular migration and the shared border, including ways in which we might enhance the safe third country agreement. Uh, member for Mr. Speaker, supply management works. Martin Joubert and Émilie Courchen of Upton's Ferme de la Carrière have told me how important supply management is to their survival. If supply management were to collapse, they would lose their farm. Farmers like Martin are concerned, and for good reason. The NDP will continue to fight for people just like Martin and his family. The Prime Minister told farmers that he wouldn't make any concessions on supply management. So when will he make good on his promise? Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I appreciate my honourable colleague's question. And I indicate to her and the, and the House that we are the party that fought to implement supply management. Yeah, we knew yeah. the value of supply management. Right. We are the government that's going to defend supply management. Right. The Prime Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and other ministers, including myself, and it is stated quite clearly, we are going to defend supply management. Thank you, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. The member for North Island, Powell River. Mr. Speaker, this summer I met Pat, a woman in her 80s who ended up homeless after battling a life-threatening illness. She ended up in a hotel, which costs $2,000 a month. It costs more than her monthly pension. Her loved ones did everything they could to help with medication, with food and essentials, but what she needed was a home she could afford on her pension. When will the Liberals actually do something to ensure that seniors like Pat don't go through something like this again? Uh, Honourable Minister of Social Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm proud and pleased to be able to answer this question. We have invested resources which seniors had long awaited for in our last budgets. We have invested in the guaranteed income supplement. We have moved the age of eligibility to old age security back from 67 to 65, thereby avoiding 100,000 seniors from falling into severe poverty. We are investing in a 40 billion plus housing strategy, which is going to give a safe and affordable home to hundreds of thousands of Canadians in the next 10 years. I invite my colleague to be in touch with me so I can demonstrate to her how effective our policies have been and will be. Honourable Member for Toronto Danforth. Mr. Speaker, we all have a responsibility to keep our children safe and to protect them from becoming victims of child sexual abuse and exploitation online. When this imagery is posted online, it continues the victimization of the most vulnerable members of our society. 
Can the minister please tell us what he is doing to help victims and to remove this horrendous imagery from the internet? Public safety. Your online sexual exploitation is an absolutely horrific crime. We are fighting it on many fronts. For example, we're investing $4.1 million in the Canadian Centre for Child Protection to help identify victims, improve support services, and develop high-tech tools to shut criminals down. A further $19 million is strengthening the RCMP's National Child Exploitation Coordination Centre, and we're working through the G7, the Five Eyes, and Internet service providers to get dangerous, offensive material off the internet as rapidly as possible and keep it from going on in the first place. Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal carbon tax will hit Canadian families hard. And yet, the government is per, uh, persisting with it. This summer, in Ontario and Alberta, the governments there decided to say no to these Liberal threats. Alberta withdrew, and the federal government is still barreling forward. They're doing absolutely nothing to help small businesses who are also going to be hit hard by the Liberal carbon tax. Why is the Liberal government insisting on directly attacking our small businesses and all Canadian families with this tax? Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, we have a plan to grow our economy and to protect the environment. We created over 500,000 jobs and reduced uh, our greenhouse gas emissions at the same time. We are taking concrete steps. But once again, I want to know, what is the Conservative plan to tackle climate change and to grow the economy in a greener fashion? Honourable Member for Carleton. The Prime Minister promised that his deficit would be tiny, temporary, and $10 billion. It was none of those three things. In fact, it's now three times what he promised, and according to his own finance department, it will continue until the year 2045. The <coughs> Prime Minister has failed to keep his promise, and he has failed to indicate when the budget will finally be balanced. Will he tell us today? Honourable <laughs> Minister of Finance. We promised Canadians that we would move forward on a plan to invest in Canadians, to invest in Canadian families, to invest in the middle class. That is exactly what we've done. Coming on three years, what's happened as a result of that plan? Those investments have put more money in Canadians' pockets. Family of four, an average family of four, middle class family in 2019 will be $2,000 better off than they were in 2015. That's the kind of impact that we've made on families, which has made a measurable impact on our economy in a positive way. We will continue to invest in Canadian families. We will continue to have confidence in our future. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, that's not true. We know that uh, the average Canadian family is paying $800 more in income tax, and that's even before the carbon tax and the higher payroll taxes take effect. The question was about the deficit. In fact, by 2021, only three years from now, the government will be spending more on debt interest than we currently spend on health transfers. Shame. That's higher taxes in exchange for absolutely nothing. Wow. Will the finance minister tell us when will the budget be balanced? Yeah. Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I will continue to tell Canadians that we know that it's critically important that we invest in a positive future in our country. Those investments have made an enormous difference for Canadians. And as I said, the facts are clear. We put in place measures that not only lowered middle class taxes, but they helped families with the Canada Child Benefit that's made an enormous difference. So that measurable difference, that's making a difference for our economy, that's going to allow us to continue to be effective in terms of helping middle class families, that will continue to be our agenda. Honourable Member for Carleton. The government's agenda is not only higher taxes on the middle class today, it's higher taxes down the road yeah, to yeah. pay the wealthy bondholders and bankers that own Canada's out-of-control national debt. Already $60 billion in additional debt under this government. Another 25 years of deficits, according to his own finance department. Will his fall economic update include a deadline for a balanced budget, and will he tell us today what that deadline is? Yeah. Honourable Minister of Finance. 
Mr. Speaker, we will not take any lessons from the party that left us with the lowest growth rate since the Great Depression. What we are continuing to focus on is how we can grow our economy. We know that puts us in a better position for tomorrow. We know that our debt as a function of our GDP is going down over time. So we're doing in a fiscally responsible way what we promised we do. Make life better for middle class Canadians, put more money in their pockets so they can raise their families and have a successful and optimistic view of the future. The Honourable Member for Victoria. I've been getting calls from so many Canadians and constitutional experts deeply concerned about the reckless erosion of our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. These people are outraged that a Premier has casually promised to repeatedly use the notwithstanding clause to override our constitutional rights whenever he disagrees with the courts. So, Mr. Speaker, will the Liberals support my motion in the Justice Committee to meet and discuss how we can end the reckless erosion of our Charter? And will the Prime Minister commit today to never use the notwithstanding clause? Bravo. Honourable Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. Mr. Speaker, obviously committees are free to determine their own agenda. Mr. Speaker, our government believes that Canadians expect all orders of government to uphold their rights and freedoms as guaranteed by the Charter and respect the rule of law. The rights and freedoms guaranteed by the Charter are of utmost importance in our society, and our government will always stand up and defend them. The notwithstanding clause is an extraordinary part of the Constitution that should only be used in the most exceptional of cases, and the government of Ontario's disappointing decision to use this clause, we think Ontarians will ultimately decide on the actions of their provincial government. The Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières. Mirabel Chiquan and hundreds of other victims of Puritite, who are caught in a regulatory gray zone, have no access to any financial aid. Why? Because up to now, both Conservatives and Liberals have refused to solve the problem by funding a scientific study on Puritite. So, Ms. Chiquan, like many other families who have tried to sell their houses, risks losing a lifetime's worth of investment. Mr. Speaker, Will the Liberals play politics at the expense of victims, or will they announce now a solution to this ongoing problem? General Minister of Economic Development. The of ensuring consistency in design and construction of new buildings in Canada. The National Research Council of Canada, in partnership with the University Laval, is leading a Canada-wide research, development, and technology transfer a project to resolve the outstanding issues raised by the member opposite. The project will really look at issues to ensure Canadian safety and minimize future economic impact of the issues raised by the member opposite as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The member for Caribou, Prince George. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister's summer of failure included his close childhood friend and most trusted minister being found guilty of breaking ethics laws. Now, the Prime Minister stood in this House time and time again telling Canadians how proud he was of his friend's decision to award a lucrative contract to close Liberal friends and his own family. Now that the Ethics Commissioner has found his good friend guilty, will the Prime Minister continue to turn a blind eye, or will he set aside friendship, do the right thing, and fire his morally challenged friend? Mr. Speaker, as public office holders, all of us have an obligation to follow the Act. And when there is uncertainty about the interpretation of the Act, Mr. Speaker, it's our responsibility to work with the Commissioner's Office to get that clarity. While the Commissioner found in this case that there was no financial benefit and no preferential treatment given, he said I should have consulted his office prior to making the decision. Mr. Speaker, I accept the Commissioner's finding, and obviously I'll work with his office on any future action. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, in their summer of failure, this Liberal government and its ministers reminded us that they're just as willing to break their own rules as the Conflict of Interest Act. Caught in big-ticket cash-for-access fundraisers, the Prime Minister promised strict new rules. But today we learn that registered lobbyists are still buying their way into exclusive Liberal fundraising events to mingle with ministers and PMO power brokers. Mr. Speaker, why doesn't the Prime Minister stop the double talk and simply order an end to this highly unethical practice? Minister. 
fine constitutions. Mr. Speaker, we are taking concrete action to improve our already strong and robust rules around political fundraising events. We are proud that the Liberal Party is already disclosing more information about their fundraisers. However, Mr. Speaker, what we don't know is who is attending high-ticket cost fundraisers from the other side, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Like, what about the $1,000 fundraiser that was held on February 28, 2018 by the Conservatives? Or how about the $1,550 fundraiser that was held on May 25, 2017 by the Conservatives? Who is attending those fundraisers, Mr. Speaker? The uh, member for Beaupalco de Beaupre, Ile d'Orléans, Charlevoix. We've learned that the Liberals broke their own fundraising rules. They allowed lobbyists to pay to have access to ministers several times. Ministers and the Prime Minister have been caught by the Ethics Commissioner, but they continue to roll out the red carpet for lobbyists who try to influence their decisions. They think that laws are for others, but not for them. Mr. Speaker, why are the Liberals so corrupt? Why are they continuing their summer of failure? Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I said in English, we are proud on this house, uh, this side of the house, that uh, we have this information. But what, we do have information about what's happened on our fundraisers, but we don't know who is attending the Conservative Party fundraisers. There are a lot of uh, events that are held in secret, and we don't know who, is this, who attends. Honourable Member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we know that more than two-thirds of more than 90 Indigenous languages still spoken in Canada are in danger of being lost. The loss of these languages were the intentional result of past government policies like residential schools. I was pleased, Mr. Speaker, to see the Prime Minister and the Minister of Canadian Heritage and Multiculturalism are following through on their promise and have put in the mandate letter instructions to deliver on Indigenous Language Act co-developed with Indigenous peoples. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Canadian Heritage and Multiculturalism please update the House of Commons on the government's progress on this file? I have my niece. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the, the member from Niagara Centre for his question. As he knows, no relationship is more important to our government than the one with the Indigenous people, and we continue to engage with First Nations, meeting Inuit peoples on this important issue. This bill will allow us to pres preserve, promote and revitalize Aboriginal languages. This is an absolute priority for me and for the Prime, Min Prime Minister and the entire government. The Honourable Member for Chicoutimi Le Fjord. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I remember that during the 2015 election campaign, the Prime Minister had said that no veteran should have to fight the government for the support that they need and deserve. But a few months ago, he told a former soldier that he was asking too much of the government. And today, we've learned that $372 million that had been earmarked for our veterans have been sitting idle in government coffers. Why this other broken promise, and why can't the Prime Minister respect our veterans? Honourable Minister of uh, Veterans. Inside the House, let me congratulate the member on his first question during question period. <laughs> let me also say that ensuring veterans receive all the benefits that they have earned is our top priority. Our benefits are demand driven, so whether it's 10 or whether it's 10,000 veterans, they will receive the benefits to which they deserve. And they are based on estimates, and this process guarantees that whether a veteran comes forward this year or next year or the year after, the money is always there for them. We know that because in three years, this government has invested $10 billion in benefits and services for our veterans. And let me remind that member on that side of the House, Mr. Speaker, that in three years, that the Harper Conservatives did nothing but cut, cut benefits and cut services. Order. I remember the, I remind the member for Durham that keep ensuring that all members can speak when it's their turn is a responsibility not only of the speaker, but of all of us. Honourable Member for Longueuil Saint-Hubert, 
Mr. Speaker, Marianne Simard has a serious form of cancer. She's a mother from Longueuil, whose life has been completely turned upside down by this diagnosis. But the Liberal government has only given her five, 15 weeks of EI to recover. It doesn't make any sense. And this is despite repeated promises from the Prime Minister and the Minister of Families. This is despite 600,000 signatures on a petition simply asking the government to keep its promise. Is there a minister in this house who can look Marianne in her eyes and admit that they let her down? Or will they finally do the right thing and increase those 15 weeks? The Honourable Minister of Social Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank my colleague for his question. He knows well that this government was elected on a promise of helping and supporting middle class families and those working hard to join it, in particular, those who may be suffering for reasons out of their control. That's why in 2015 we've made, since 2015, we've made significant changes to increase flexibility of the EI system. And I would be very happy, Mr. Speaker, to provide more details. I can assure the member that the current EI system is working for everyone. The Honourable Member for Nickel Belt. Mr. Speaker, this summer I had the pleasure of making a significant announcement in my writing. Our Liberal government will be improving a significant grade crossing in the city of Capriol. Not only will this investment improve safety for pedestrians and drivers, it will also allow trains to move faster and it will reduce wait times at the Young Street crossing. In light of this important announcement, could the Honourable Minister of Transport update this House about our engagement toward rail safety? The Honourable Minister, I'd like to thank the member for Nickel Belt for his question and for his hard work in his writing. In fact, he is the one who approached me about this particular grade crossing. We recognize that rail safety is important for communities such as Capriol, and we are very happy to be able to uh, upgrade that grade crossing. It's important to minimize the risk of collision and to have uh, traffic flow more smoothly. As you know, Mr. Speaker, rail sa safety is my priority. Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Under this Prime Minister, Canada's position in the world has been diminished and our ability to deliver on our defence commitments has been undermined by politics. Purchasing used CF-18s from the Australians will not give us capability, will be cost prohibitive and frankly humiliating when we should be reassuring our allies in a time of unprecedented global instability. Will the Prime Minister finally cancel this flawed purchase and equip our pilots with the aircraft they need to get the job done on the world? Honorable Order. Order. The Honorable Minister of National Defense. Order. Mr. Speaker, while the previous Harper Conservatives cut billions from defense as part of the Deficit Reduction Action Plan, um, Mr. Speaker, with our new uh, government's defense policy, we are in, uh, increasing the defense budget by 70 percent, Mr. Speaker. While the previous government uh, closed uh, Veterans Affairs offices, Mr. Speaker, we reopened them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Mirabel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. During the by-election in Lac-Saint-Jean, the Prime Minister had promised that he would fully protect supply management with the TPP, but we know what happened. He didn't do that. The same thing happened with the Shikudami by-election. He said that he would fully protect uh, supply management in NAFTA, but we know what happened. Fully is no longer the operational word. There are elections uh, coming up. Will the Prime Minister, finally grow a spine and uh, stand up to the American government. Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I can indicate clearly to this House, the Prime Minister, other Cabinet Ministers and myself, and indicated quite clearly we will fully support supply management. Uh, it's important to realize, Mr. Speaker, that we're the party that fought to implement supply management, that's right. and we're the party that's going to implement supply management, Mr. Speaker. We understand the importance, this government, of the supply management system in this country. Here, here. I have deputy. Honorable Member for Joliet. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What we want is 
full defense of supply management. Last week, the member for Bose uh, called his former conservative colleagues hypocrites because he says that in private, they'll tell you that they're against supply management, but they can't or won't talk about it publicly. Well, that sounds like a conservative idea, Mr. Speaker. But given all the ways that the government has left supply management open to attack, I have to wonder, is there also a rule against speaking out about this on the Liberal side, or are they actually defending farmers? And I appreciate my honourable colleague's uh, question. I cannot respond for the opposition if they are split on the supply management system. The Conservative Party is split on the supply management system. That is most unfortunate. But I can assure you, every member on this side of the House of Commons fully right. supports the supply management system. They fully understand. They fully understand. They fully understand how important it is to the agricultural sector. This party fought to implement supply management, and this government will preserve supply management. Thank you, Mr. Honourable yeah. Member for Nunavut. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, Northern Affairs and Internal Trade. It's over a year now since the Nutrition North report was issued and we're still waiting for action. On his recent visit to Iqaluit, the new minister discovered that this was an urgent issue. Five times I've raised this in the House and the answer is always, we're taking our time to get it right. I just have to wonder how long it takes this government to get something right. My question is, the Prime Minister has given him a specific mandate to fix and expand the program. Will the Minister share what his timeline is to do that? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Government and Northern Affairs. Speaker, I want to thank my colleague from Nunavut for his question. As he knows, when I visited Nunavut and the other two Northern Territories, this was a subject of discussion that I had not only with the Premiers of the Territorial Governments, but with Indigenous leaders and business leaders as well. I share my honourable colleague's sense of urgency. My colleague from Labrador, who is the Parliamentary Secretary, uh, has been working on this. She and I have some specific ideas that will respond to innovative solutions that we've heard from Northerners about a program important to Northerners, and I look forward to working with my colleague in this regard. Yeah. Tabling of documents.